list. Versus prayer that is genuine heart-to-heart communication with God as a friend. And then the third leg of the school is sharing with others what I am experiencing in the first two. Now, if any one of the legs of this stool is missing and you try to put your weight on it, you try to sit on it, what will happen? It's not going to last. You will fall. And if you think about it as I think about it in my life, any moments in my life where I find myself falling in my Christian journey, I can trace it back to one or two or sometimes all three of these legs being missing in my life. So tonight we're going to focus on the Bible. I want to tell you my Bible story. How many of you love a good Bible story? This is my Bible story. This is my story about the Bible. I was raised in a Christian home. My dad is, a, is an Adventist minister, a pastor, still pastoring out in London. And so I was raised coming to church every weekend, every Sabbath, and going to Sabbath school and all those good things. And the Bible was read in my home. It was an important book. We respected it. We, we read the Bible. We prayed. I remember when I was about 14 years old, um, it was my birthday, and I was hoping for something really exciting. And for my birthday, I was given a Bible. And I'm ashamed to admit today that I was not excited when I opened it because I thought it was something good, like a video game or something. But no, my parents gave me a Bible. And it had tiny, tiny letters. There were no pictures. It was a grown-up Bible. I I forget the translation, but maybe it was King James or New King James, something like that. Uh, And I just, it was like a slog, just reading it. It just didn't make any sense to me. Well, as I shared with you a couple nights before, around the age of 18, I was baptized when I was 12, but around the age of 18 is uh, when I kind of had a reconversion experience. And so I started reading the Bible for myself. I had a, I now had a desire to read God's Word. The click of conversion was happening in my life, and now I was interested in what was once boring. Now it was interesting. But I have to be honest, I, when I went back to that Bible, I read it, but it still didn't really make sense. It felt like kind of trying to swim through molasses. And at the time, uh, there were a lot of the young people, the the youth of of, of my church and other churches in London, who were carrying around this very colorful, shiny, cool, up-to-date looking Bible for, you know, the late 90s. And it was called a student Bible. And I was like, I'm 18, I'm about to go to university, I'm about to be a student, I want to get a student Bible. Now this was, uh, the translation I believe was like the, the contemporary English version, which is kind of like the NIV, or, but, but in plain English. And I remember reading it, and for the first time, it felt like I was reading the Bible and I was understanding the words without having to translate in my head into contemporary English. Now listen, I... I love the King James Version of the Bible. This is the Bible that's in my brain. When I think to quote a verse, this is the the, the language that comes to me. But I have to be honest. As I read that Bible in that newer translation, for the first time, the Bible started to come to life. Especially the New Testament. I mean, the stories are the stories. But as I was reading, especially some of Paul's writings, like Romans and Galatians, suddenly it was like, huh? Huh? Is this what it really has been saying all along? I I couldn't put it down. It was like a bestseller. And so I I read that book until the covers, that that, that Bible until the covers fell off. It was amazing. And so I had this increased hunger to know and to understand the Bible. So I went to university. You know, I moved uh, three, four hours away from from my home. Didn't have the privilege of going to a Christian university. I went to a, a sort of a state, as you would say, a state school. But there was a wonderful... Uh, Adventist student fellowship there and we would meet on the weekends and we would share together and eat together and you know test our fledgling recipes on each other and if we didn't die you know we survived the next week we, we kept that recipe and if someone got sick we threw that recipe out you know student days right and so but we would study together and I found myself though I didn't know everything but I was leading this group of students as as we would study the Bible. And so I would spend time in the week when I should have been studying, preparing these, you know, Friday night discussion talks, Bible studies. And even though I was a pastor's son, 
and I had gone through all the Sabbath school and pathfinders and everything that the church had to offer, fantastic though it was, I realized no one had ever taught me how to study the Bible for myself. I had been taught what to believe. I had been shown where the verses were that show that the Sabbath is the seventh day. I had been shown all of these things, but no one had ever given me the key, it felt like, to the Bible and said, here, go discover and explore. And so when I was trying to find out, uh, you know, how can we, from a biblical perspective, as young people, understand things like, you know, relationships or what career should we have or what to do with our doubts, there was no ready-made Bible study that I could turn to, and I didn't know how to understand the Bible for myself. And so I was stuck. And so I spent maybe two or three years at university, desperately trying, asking everyone I could ask, please tell me, how do I study the Bible? And people gave me all kinds of great advice. But ultimately, uh, everything that they were telling me was basically... Uh, how to be convinced of the truths of our church. And that's great, but I wanted to know how to find the Bible for myself. Now, here's something that in interesting that happened. And this is, this, is, uh, this is my Bible story. So I remember the first, my first year at university, this was before everyone had their personal computers, their laptops, etc. We had computer labs. Any of you remember the days of computer labs? That's where you had to go to do your work. And so I made like a little covenant for myself. I said, okay, I will not do any work for my school before I have spent some time reading the Bible and praying. That was just my own personal uh, covenant. And so unfortunately, there were many days when I didn't feel like reading the Bible and praying, and subsequently neither did I do any schoolwork. <laughs> But there were many, many days when I would get to the, to the, to the um, computer lab there and I'd put the keyboard to the side to make a little space. And I had a small journal, uh, much like the one that was, was here. And I don't know who gave me this idea. I don't know where I got it from. But what I would do is that I would read a passage from the Bible and then I would just start making notes. I guess I was doing stuff that I did as a student. You know, you would read the textbook and you make notes. So I guess maybe that's where it came from. So I would read a chapter or so of the Gospel of Matthew or whatever it was, and I would start making notes. And I would notice that as I was making notes, just things I had never thought of that I'd never noticed, things that no one had ever said in the sermon or I'd never heard in the Sabbath school, just kind of occurred to me as I was reading the Bible. I was like, wow. So I'd write it down and I'd write it down. And a lot of it at the beginning was just questions. Well, why did he say it like this? And why did they do that? And why was this? And why was that? And why were the other? And I would just write down these things. And after I f f couldn't think of anything else to write, I would pray and I would close the book. I didn't know at the time that God was teaching me how to unpack his word. I, I thought I was just doing my own thing. And still I was searching and searching and searching. How? How do you read the Bible? How can you understand the Bible? How can you hear God's voice through the Bible? Well, here's what started to happen to me. And it was a very scary moment. I started to write down things, and as I would write down things, ideas came to my mind that I had never heard my dad preach, or I had never read in the Sabbath school lesson. And I, at, the, at the beginning, I was thinking, I'll be honest with you, I was thinking, uh-oh, maybe, maybe the enemy is giving me false ideas about the Bible. This can't be true. I mean, if this is there, someone would have said it already. I'm not smarter than everybody else. How come I'm dead in this? So I would be very, very nervous. And this is what I, started, this is what I would do. As I would write things down, if, if an idea came to my mind that was different and I wasn't sure it was from, I would go and I would read like from the Desire of Ages, the same chapter on that thing, on that, on that passage from the gospel. And if it was there, I was like, phew, okay, I'm safe. That one wasn't heretical. But over time, I started to discover, I started to realize, wait, as I am reading this book, and as I'm asking God to speak to me, and as I'm just writing down these observations, God really is giving me ideas, thoughts, uh, concepts from his word directly through his Holy Spirit, not through a sermon, not through a book, not through a song, great as all of those things are. I started to realize that God could talk to me himself through the Bible. And that is the beginning of the rest of my journey. 
Now, I wish, what I'm about to share with you, I wish someone had told me then. I kind of found it out the back way. But tonight, I'm going to share with you, and based on what I saw on Sabbath at your morning blend, I'm sure that Pastor Tyler has shared with you something very similar. But I'm going to share with you something tonight that hopefully will help you turn the Bible, if it hasn't become like this, from a book just of words into a communication vice uh, between you and God. Here's what Jesus says. Jesus says in John chapter 6, 35, I am the bread of life. He who comes to me, she who comes to me will never hunger and he who believes in me shall never thirst. Jesus is, is, is using this idea of food, this idea of bread, this idea of eating to describe his relationship with us. There is something about Jesus that is essential to you as your daily bread. Now, I don't know if you come from a bread culture. Jesus grew up in a bread culture. Maybe if he was from a different place, he would have said, I am the rice of life. Maybe he would have said, I am the spaghetti of life. I, I don't know for the, this new generation, you know, I am the, um, you know, the, the, the what, what's this? What's this, these new grains that everyone's eating? I am the quinoa of life. I, I don't know. The point is, he's trying to say that just like the daily food we eat, we should have that same kind of daily nourishment from him. Now, obviously, I'm not encouraging you to go home and eat pages out of your Bible and just put them in your mouth with some mustard. That's not what he means. He means something much more spiritual than that. In the same chapter, Jesus says, Moses did not give you the bread from heaven. The people, when he said this statement, they were like, whoa, whoa, whoa. What do you mean, Jesus? Moses is the one who gave us the bread, the manna from heaven. And Jesus is saying, well, hold on a second. Yes, Moses gave you some bread in the wilderness, but that was just a symbol of something greater. He says, but my father gives you the true bread from heaven. For the bread of God is he who comes down from heaven and gives life to the world. Jesus is comparing himself to the time when God gave manna to the children of Israel in the wilderness. And he's saying, just as Moses, uh, just as manna came from heaven uh, in the time of Moses, in the same way, Jesus is, in, is, is, is God's bread, God's sustenance for me and you today. So what does that look, mean? Let's have a look at the, uh, little, a few of the verses there in Exodus. Um, and we're going to look at these different parts of this story and we're going to use it to help us to understand how we can eat the bread of life, which is Jesus through his word. So here is the question. When should we read? If Jesus is the bread of life, if, 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 if the story of the manna is in, in, in a sense like a, a template for us to understand how to interact with Jesus, then when should we read? Okay, when should we eat the bread of life? Let's have a look. Exodus chapter 16, verse 21, says this. So they gathered it, that's manna, every morning, every man according to his need, and when the sun became hot, it melted. So they were in the wilderness, the children of Israel. They had no food. They were, you know, days and days away from Egypt, and they were not yet in the promised land, and the people were hungry. And what did they do? They had no Uber Eats, okay? They were in serious trouble. They complained against Moses. Oh, you've brought us out here to kill us. And so Moses prayed and God sent them manna, but there were some rules along with the manna. One of the rules was this. You had to get the manna in the morning. If you waited till midday, till the sun came up, the manna would melt and it would be gone. What is the echo of this? How does this connect to our experience with eating the bread of life. I don't know about you, but I've discovered that if there's something that is important to me that I want to do every day, I have to do it in the morning. If I don't do it in the morning, then it might not happen. So when it comes to spending time with God, the morning is the best time. Now I know there's someone here who's saying, yes, but pastor, I work night shifts. I work third shift. Okay, fine. When is your morning? When do you start your day? Is it four in the afternoon before you get ready for your shift? Fine. Well, then that's your morning. But whenever it is that your day starts, that is the time to spend time with God. If you wait, I guarantee you 
something will happen and you will look up and the day will be gone and you will say, oh, I forgot again, tomorrow. The morning is the best time to spend with God. Now, some of you are going to say, um, I'm not a morning person. And for you, I'm also uh, a night owl. But for us, there is a promise in the Bible that I have tested and I know it works. And it's upsetting that it works. I'm going to explain in a minute. Here in Isaiah chapter 40, uh, 50 verse 4, it says this. He, that's God, wakens me morning by morning, wakens my ear to listen like one being taught. This was Isaiah's experience, but this verse is also a pre-shadowing of what Jesus would experience. But I want to let you know today that God is living, he is alive, he is real. And if you ask him to wake you up in the morning so that you can spend time with him, he will do it. Now, I need to put a warning on this. The Bible says that God does not slumber or sleep. So, <laughs> 4 o'clock in the morning, 3.30 in the morning, he's just hanging out, like, wondering what's going on. I can personally testify to this. And I, I wish I could say that I'm doing this right now, but I'll be honest. Sometimes, I just, I just uh, the, the sleep, the pillow pulls me down. But there have been so many times in my life where I have said, God, wake me up. I'm not going to set an alarm. If you want me to get up tomorrow and spend time with you early, wake me up. And I will, I will tell you, without fail, 3.30, 4 in the morning, 4.30, sometimes 2.30, I just wake up and I'm not tired. Nothing's happened. No one touched me. I'm just, I'm just alert. Sometimes, I'm, I'm not trying to say this to you know, sound like some kind of holy person, but sometimes I wake up having heard my name, I hear Jonathan, and I'm like, in that moment, completely alert. Now, there, there is a caveat to this. After like an hour and a half, my body starts to catch up. And, I, and it says, what are you doing up at 5.30? <laughs> What's going on? And uh, I'm, I'm still trying to figure this out because there have been times when I, when I have gotten up, spent some time with God and gone back to sleep, and when I do that, then I'm just really, really tired the rest of the day. And there are other times when I just push through, and I'm tired in the evening, um, but I make it through the day. So I'm not going to tell you how to do it, but I will tell you this. You can hold God to his promise. If you want to spend time with him, you are speaking his language because he desperately wants to spend time with you. He loves you. He cares about you. You are so special to him, and he will wake you up. Now, this is the great thing about this. No more guilt about feeling like I'm not waking up for God. If God decides tomorrow I need to sleep till 10 a.m. and he doesn't wake me up, hey. But if I put it in his lap, God, I want to know you. I want to spend time with you in your word in the morning when there are less distractions. Wake me up. You leave that with him and let him decide when you get up. But like I said, warning, he may wake you up earlier than you would wake yourself up. But I have had some of the most amazing times with God in those morning hours as I've opened his word and he has spoken things into my life that, that just are still resonant today. Now, Jesus had the same experience. Here in Mark 1.35, it says this, Now, in the morning, having risen a long while before daylight, now Jesus lived in Palestine, and in Palestine the sun rises and sets like clockwork, around 6 a.m. every morning and 6 p.m. every day. So a long while before daylight is 4.30? 4? So apparently Jesus was also experiencing this <laughs> being woken up early situation. And he went out to a solitary place and there he prayed. Do you have such beautiful uh, nature around you? Maybe why don't you try when you get up in the morning, rather than going to your nice, warm, comfortable chair in the den, which makes you remember how comfortable and warm your bed is, go out into nature. You have this great weather where you don't have you know, feet of snow for three, four months of the year. Maybe go outside and experience God in nature like he intended. Jesus did this and it gave power to his ministry. The power that Jesus had didn't come because he knew all the verses in the Bible. It came from this time of connection with his father day by day, morning by by morning, and you can have the same. All right, let's keep moving. So, so how much time? 
Here's the verse. Exodus chapter 16, verse 16. It says, let every man or woman gather it. That's the manna, the bread of life, the bread from heaven. Gather it according to each one's needs. I want to outlaw. I want to break down. I want to get rid of the spiritual competition where we judge each other based on how long and how much and how often we read and pray. Everyone's appetite is different. We were having a conversation about this just today. There are some of us who a couple snacks and you feel great for the day. There are others that if you don't get three square meals, then you're miserable. The same is true spiritually. Someone can spend five minutes in God's presence and be charged up. For someone else, they might need five hours. The one who needs five hours isn't more holy than the one who takes five minutes. The point is, each one take the time that you need to be really connected with God. Can I challenge you on this? And I'm challenging myself. Tell God, I will not leave this moment until I have the assurance that I have connected with you. If you do that every day, God will decide how long it is today. Some days it will be longer, some days it will be shorter, but you will get what you need. That was the way for the manna. There was no measurement for everyone. Each one got what they needed. And the one who got more didn't have too much. The one who took less didn't have any uh, wasted. So I want to talk to you because um, you might be thinking, yes, uh, that's true, but surely shouldn't, shouldn't I be able to grow in the time that I spend with God? I uh, have been going to the gym, and you might not be able to tell, but I've been going to the gym. I I've had a gym membership. I've been a member at the gym for many years. I didn't always regularly attend, but I've been a member. My name had been on the books. And, uh, but more recently, I have been more consistent at the gym and I've recently started a weightlifting program called 5x5. Five 5x5, by five. Uh, five by five, and what this weightlifting program, you basically do uh, five different motions. You squat, you deadlift, you do like a shoulder press movement, uh, you do like a chest press and a row. It's like five what they call compound movements, and it's supposed to be a, a whole body strengthening kind of way of exercising. And I was looking online and I saw some great reviews about it, so I started it. Now the thing about 5x5 five five is that 5x5, five five, and, and I don't know if any of you go to the gym, but if you go to the gym, you may know that there are many people who go to the gym who are not lifting weights, they are lifting their egos. And what I mean by that is they put way more weight on the bar than they can really lift, but they don't want the other people in the gym to think they're weak. And so there they are with terrible form, doing like a few things, and they do nothing. And that was me for many years, doing nothing but thinking I'm doing something. But 5x5 five five makes you take an honest look in the mirror and say, what can you really lift doing it properly? And when you do that, it, it drastically reduces the weights you can lift. So I remember about three, three, four months ago when I started the program, you know, I was, the, those of you who know the gym, there's that like barbell and it's 45 pounds. It's, it's the lightest thing you can lift on a barbell. And that's where I had to start with my squats. There were no weights on the bar. And I'm there doing it properly. And like next to me, there are these small, tiny ladies lifting like, you know, two big plates and more and just like, whew, whew, just like it's nothing. And here I am, this big guy from the, from the Caribbean, and I'm lifting just the bar and sweating and struggling because I'm doing the form correctly. It was so humbling, but I, I said, you know what? I'm going to follow the program. And the program says, every time you've, you correctly complete all the movements, you get to increase the weight by five pounds. So you know what was even more embarrassing than lifting just the bar? It was the next week when I had to put 2.5 pounds on each end. Now, I don't know if you've never been to the gym, the 2.5 pounds don't even look like real weights. They look like the, what the kids play with, right? Now, when it was just the bar, people could think, oh, he's just warming up. Big guy like him, this is just the warm-up set. I could pretend. But when I got the 2.5 weights on the end, like, oh, it's embarrassing. 
And then, and then the next time I can add, I can add more. So now it's five pounds on the end. I'm really doing something there. And so you can imagine, you know, how slowly it builds up. And guess what? If you miss a week, you have to go back. Oh, it was so, so painful. And I had to go back. But here's the amazing thing. As I have consistently done this week by week, now I'm lifting, I'm squatting like 125 pounds. It's, just, it's almost becoming impressive. People now start to look at me in the gym like, oh, yeah. I look back at them like, you know, <laughs> it's all God, you know, it's not. Little by little, I'm able to handle more. But here's what, a lot, here's what I used to do in the past. I haven't been in the gym for months. I look in the mirror one day. Oh, oh, no, it doesn't look good. That's it. I'm going to the gym at 5 a.m. And I go the first day and I'm energized. And I try to lift what I used to lift when I was working out. And I push through and I'm gritting and I'm grunting. And I do it that first day. And then I'm so sore for the rest of the week that I don't go to the gym for another three months. That's what many of us do with God. We haven't done anything spiritual. We come to a revival meeting. We've, That's it. I'm up 5 a.m. every morning. I'm going to read the Bible in a year. A week later, man, I, oh, it's too much. So start where you are. But if you add little by little, you will be surprised at where you end up in the end. So how often? How often should we eat the bread of life? Well, how often do you eat food? In, in Exodus 16, 19, it says, and Moses said, let no one leave any of it till morning. You should spend time with God every day. Now, there are some of us who are on this uh, spiritual eating once a week diet. Do You know about that? It's where you eat all your spiritual food on Sabbath, and then you try to make it the rest of the week, and you get to about Monday, and you're so hungry that you start treating everyone around you badly. Don't do that. Eat every day. Spend time with God every day. Okay, so how do I eat the bread of life? Here's, here's where, if you're taking notes, this is the time. I want to read to you a couple of quotes from Desire of Ages, and then I'm going to share with you an acronym that I think will be helpful. Ellen White, I believe she was inspired as she wrote. She says this. We should carefully study the Bible. Asking God for the aid of the Holy Spirit, that we may understand his word. One cannot understand the word of God without the Holy Spirit. Then she says, we should take one chapter. No, I can't, I can't say one verse. This is Ellen White. She's really strict and down the line. Surely she would expect us to take at least one chapter a day. Is that what, is that what she says? One verse. Wow. We should take one verse and concentrate the mind on the task of discovering the thought which God has put in that verse. Almost fell off there. For us. Now, I want to say something now, and, and maybe this is not for anyone in the room. But there, have, there has been, and again, I, I think everyone means well, but sometimes people speak without fully perhaps understanding. There has been ideas that have floated around the church that look down on an approach to reading scripture where I'm looking to see what the Bible is saying to me. People say things like, oh, the Bible, it's not about you, it's not about your feelings, it's about knowing the truth of God. And I, and I agree with that. But here the servant of God to our people said, God has put something in every verse for us. So there, so there are two, at least two there. there I'm sure it's infinite because God is infinite. But there are at least two levels on which the Bible can be read. One can read the Bible and compare scripture with scripture to understand what God is teaching for the world. But there is also a level of reading the Bible where I'm understanding what God is saying to me. God wants to speak to you. 
And what he says to you is unique to you. And it may not be exactly the same thing that he says to me. Which, by the way, is why two people can read the same passage and come away with different things. It's not that one got it wrong and one got it right. Maybe God is trying to say something different to each of us. So she said, hey, just one verse. Try to understand, take the time to understand what God has put there for us. We should dwell upon the thought until it becomes our own. She continues, by looking constantly to Jesus. Did you you catch what she just did? You remember when we, a couple nights ago, we discovered that Jesus said, if, if, you know, just as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, so if I am lifted up and if whoever looks will live. And we talked about that. If we look to Jesus, then that's how the Holy Spirit transforms our life. She is now explaining to us what looking to Jesus actually means. It's not some mystical thing that we hope we can do. It's spending time with God in the Bible, taking it verse by verse, passage by passage, and trying to understand what God is saying to me. As I'm doing that, that is looking constantly to Jesus. By looking constantly to Jesus, she says, we will be strengthened. God, not Pastor Tyler, God, not your favorite evangelist, God, not your favorite uh, television channel, Christian television channel, will make the most precious revelations to his hungering, thirsting people. Can I tell you what is one of the most amazing spiritual experiences I, I ever have? When I have been reading something in God's word, and I've been hearing him say something, And then I go to church on Sabbath and maybe someone says something or someone sings a song or I read something in a spiritual book and the exact thing that God said to me, that person says. That's when I say the biggest amens. And it's not because they're the greatest preacher in the world or singer in the world, but because I realize that's so much bigger than any human could figure out. God himself is, is, is confirming the word that he's speaking to my life. What if... That's how you came to church every week. Filled with things that God has been putting in your heart through time you spent with him. Even if the preaching wasn't what you liked. Even if they didn't sing your favorite hymn. Even if the potluck wasn't saying anything. I guarantee you that you would still leave with a blessing because you would hear someone say something that God was already saying to you. God, it says, she says, can make revelations to his people. This is, this is beautiful. All right. Go back one. Okay. They will find, as we do this, we will find that Christ is a personal savior. As they feed upon his word, they will find that it is spirit and life. This is eating the bread that comes down from heaven. How do we eat the bread that comes down from heaven? We spend time, concentrate the mind on a verse or a few verses, trying to understand what God is saying to us making the thought our own. That is how we eat the bread of life. Now, I am not downplaying any other way you want to study the Bible. You want to read the Bible in a year? Great. You want to do 28 Bible study topical lessons? Fantastic. You want to read spiritual books and devotionals? Great. But you should also have as a part of your spiritual arsenal this time when you take God's word for yourself and eat it and digest it by yourself to get what God is saying to you. You should also add that. All right, so how do we do it? Let's be practical. There's an acronym called SOAP. How many of you uh, still use SOAP, wash with soap? As opposed to shower gel or, I'm talking about the block of soap. You remember the good old days? We had soap. I miss soap. Something nice about soap. I I don't know, as as a kid, I remember when I'd go to my grandma's house. My grandma is, uh, well, she was, uh, she's passed on now, but she was a, an old school Jamaican lady. Now, if you know anything about Jamaican people, one of the things they love is cleanliness. Everything has to be squeaky clean. And so I remember we'd go to her house and she'd have these bars of soap, dove soap. Okay, for those of you who, you guys have dove here, right? But that, was the, that was the best soap back in the day. And, uh, you know, you would take it and you'd put it on the flannel. No loofers back in the day. It was a flannel, right? And you'd have to... What was the flannel in an American? A washcloth. 
a washcloth, where we're speaking in tongues and translating. Flannel, washcloth, fantastic. You put it on the washcloth and you would, you would like make the, the, the suds, you say suds? Yes, lather, okay. And then you'd have to, you'd have to scrub. My, my, my grandmother would make us scrub our tiny arms until you felt the friction. And the aim was, here was the test. After you're finished, when you rinse off, you should be able to, if you rub your skin, you should be able to hear a squeak. Squeak. If you heard a squeak, then you were clean. If not, she made you do the whole thing again, right? Those were the days. And you had to, you had to clean the tub because if you didn't, when you use soap, if you don't clean the tub, you start to see the marks, right? But soap, wash with soap. So this acronym, just like how you, 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 you take a shower or how you, you, you clean yourself every morning with soap, in the same way, soap, that will be how we remember practically. So, so S stands for scripture. Where do we hear God's voice the clearest? In scripture. Can God speak through nature? Of course. Does he speak through music? Yeah. Does he sometimes speak for a friend or, or a book? Yeah. But where he speaks the clearest and the most consistently is through his word. Find a Bible that you can read comfortably. Be humble. Remember me with the five by five. If you used to be able to read those lovely small letters, but now your eyes need something larger, go ahead and be humble and buy you a large print Bible. If you need a large print Bible and the magnifying glass, there's no shame in it. If you were raised speaking one of the hundreds of beautiful languages that God has allowed in this world. And that's the language that you, that under, you understand, the one that's in your heart. Go ahead and read the Bible in that language. Do you get no brownie points for reading it in English or Spanish or French? Read it in a language you understand. I love the poetry of the King James Version. But get a translation that you can read without a dictionary next to you. Now, when you want to do your deep studies and you want to do that, great. But for your devotional time, get a translation that you can read and the language doesn't get in the way. You will not lose any heavenly brownie points for using a non-King James version of the Bible. There are so many wonderful versions. By the way, Sister White used many versions in her writings, if you check. She was not stuck with any one version. Find something that you can understand. But start with scripture. I would suggest, you can start anywhere. But I would suggest start with the gospel. If you haven't been reading the Bible for yourself in a while, start with one of the gospels because you're looking for Jesus. That's the point. And my favorite gospel is John, but you can choose whichever one you want. So that's scripture. So then what do you do? You choose a small passage of scripture. She said one verse. It could be one verse. What I usually do, I have a Bible that is subdivided by the little stories. Like Jesus walks in the water. Jesus turns water into wine. And usually it might be 10, 8 verses, a small story. I will use just one of those stories. Not a whole chapter, not, not just one story. And I will read it at least three times. Why do I read it three times? Because I'm slow. And the first time I'm reading it, I'm thinking about what I'm doing after I read the Bible. And then the second time I'm reading it, I'm reading it. And then the third time I'm reading it, I'm like noticing things. So I find that if I read it at least three times, I, I actually can, can focus my mind on the passage. So that's scripture. O is observation. I have a, a journal, or you can do it on your phone, or you can do it on your laptop, however you make notes. But I start to take notes. And the first thing I noticed is anything I notice that's unusual. Of course, before this, you pray, right? We, we, I didn't say that, but let me say it clearly. Before you open the Bible, you pray, God, speak to me as I read your word. And then I, then I, then I start making notes of anything that stands out to me. Huh, why, I've never noticed this before. I've read this story, I've heard it a hundred times, but man, I didn't realize that Jesus did this or that he said that or that Peter did that. I just jot down anything that I observe, anything unusual, anything that jumps out, anything surprising, anything confusing or upsetting. I note that down in my little journal. So that's observation. Then 
application. After I have made all the observations I can, I then go back and I ask myself the question, what might God be saying to me through this thing that I noticed in the this, in this story today? What might God be communicating to me? I'll give you an example of that in a moment. And I write this down. Maybe, ah, oh, I noticed that Peter, when he was walking on the water, when he looked away from Jesus, that's when he sank. Maybe that's what I noticed. What does that mean for me today? Maybe God is saying to me, Jonathan, keep your eyes on me. So I write that down. You, you, you write down whatever you, you think. There's no right or wrong answer. You're just trying to understand what might God be saying to me? And then the final thing is prayer. S-O-A-P, soap. Final thing is prayer. I don't know if you ever experienced this. I've, I've experienced this where I feel like my prayers are the same every day. God bless my mom, bless my dad, bless my cat, help me to get to school in time, blah, 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 in Jesus' name, amen. This is the cure for that because every day what I pray are the things that I noticed and the applications that came to me for that day. So for today, I'm praying and asking God to help fulfill the things that he has spoken to me. S stands for scripture. O stands for observation. A stands for application. And P stands for prayer. Now, if you would like to see an example of what this looks like, and this is not, I get nothing from this. This is not by way of self-promotion, but... I have a blog where, and it's been a few years since I've uploaded some new stuff, but there are several examples of this on there. It's, that's the website, pastorburnett.com. If you're interested, you can go there and you can see in that same format, S-O-A-P, SOAP, you can see how I have uh, you know, had those devotional moments with God um, at that time. So let's do, let's do, a, let's do as before, as we close, just a very brief um, example. Let's just bow our heads as we pray and ask God to speak to us. Jesus, show my friends right now that you're able to speak to us through your word and in your name. Amen. So here's a passage from the Bible. It's just four verses, five maybe. Luke 11, 9 to 13. You can look it up in your Bible. If you have a Bible, it's going to be on the screen, but use your phone, use your Bible. Imagine that this was a real life moment where you're reading this passage for yourself. Here's what it says. So I say to you, ask and it will be given to you. Seek and you will find. Knock and the door will be opened to you. For everyone who asks receives. And the one who seeks finds. And to the one who knocks, the door will be opened. For which of you fathers, if, you, if your son asks for a fish, will give him a snake instead? Or if he asks for an egg, will give him a scorpion? If then, if you then, though you are evil, know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your Father in heaven give the Holy Spirit to those who ask him? So this is, imagine this is the passage. What are some things, I wonder if anyone is willing to share something, I know we only read it once, but something that you observed, something that you noticed that maybe you had never noticed before as we read through this passage of scripture. A word, a phrase, an idea, anything that kind of stood out to your mind. Anyone? Yes. Good gifts. Give good gifts to your children. Why, what, what did you notice about that? Just, it was that? What did you think when you read that or you heard it read? Mm. Yeah. So, so that's the observation. And the application, as, 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 as you're saying, is God wants to give good gifts to you. So ask for them. God has good gifts already packaged and wrapped up for you. Ask for them and he will give them to you. Right? How beautiful is that? Anyone else? One more person. Anything that you noticed, anything that you observed in, 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 in this passage? Yes. If we seek, we will find. 
Huh, that stood out to you. What do you think God might be saying to you through that? Mm. Yes, absolutely. God is not hiding, right? He says, if you look for me, I'm right here. What a beautiful promise. What a beautiful promise. We could spend more time doing this. This is just a small example. The time is, is far spent. Here's the point tonight. If you want to have a relationship with Jesus, it starts by knowing him through his word. This is a way. This is not the way. This is a way to connect with God through Scripture. If you haven't got something that's working for you now, give this a try. You might be surprised how your life changes when you start to connect with God rather than just knowing things about God. Let's pray. Father, thank you so much for this time that we've spent tonight. Lord, I ask that each of us, that you would wake each of us up tomorrow (laughs) to spend time with you. And that as we open your word, that you would reveal precious things about yourself to us. Not only information about you, we thank you for that information, but Lord, truth about your love and your plans for us personally. May your word become a source of strength and power in our life. Take us home safely, we pray tonight, in Jesus' name, amen. God bless you. Come back tomorrow, we'll be talking about prayer for the purpose of communion with God.